Einen schönen guten Abend und herzlich willkommen hier im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums zu unserer Reihe Lecture in Film, die sich in diesem Jahr, beziehungsweise von Oktober bis Juli nächsten Jahres, dem Thema widmet Selbstporträts von anderen, das Universum von Agnes Varda. Und ja, wir freuen uns sehr, wir haben wieder einmal hochkarätige Referenten gewinnen können, beziehungsweise die Filmwissenschaft der Goethe-Universität sind darauf sehr, sehr stolz. Heute unser Gast Kelly Conway wird, ist aus den USA extra eingeflogen, aber Vincent Hediger wird sie gleich vorstellen. Ich möchte schon mal darauf hinweisen, der Film des heutigen Abends ist, wie fast alle dieser Reihe, frisch digital restauriert. Und das ist ein besonderes Vergnügen, falls Sie letzte Woche schon mal da waren. Das lohnt sich sehr, das sind alles äh, digitale Fassungen jetzt, äh, DCPs, wie das Format heißt, die direkt von Cine Tamaris, der Produktionsfirma von Agnes Wada aus Paris, zu uns kommen. Und das ist ein besonderes Vergnügen, weil die Filme sehen im Grunde aus wie neu. Und sie hat ja auch selbst abgenommen, sie war beim äh, Bearbeitungsprozess hinsichtlich Farbe und dergleichen nochmal mit dabei. Das lohnt sich sehr, alleine deswegen die Reihe zu verfolgen. Ähm, wir haben auch wie immer ein Begleitprogramm für Sie zusammengestellt, mittwochs und samstags und da möchte ich Sie auf die nächsten Filme schon mal hinweisen. Zum einen zeigen wir Ihnen Le Brousserge von Claude Chabrol, das ist auch äh, ein Frühwerk oder ein Vorgänger der Nouvelle Vague sozusagen, die Enttäuschten. Und wir zeigen zwei Filme von Chris Marker aus derselben Zeit, 1957, Lettre de Sibéry und eben ein Vorfilm Dimanche à Pékin, ähm, beides Dokumentarfilme, die auch in dieser Zeit entstanden sind und ja, die haben sich gegenseitig alle irgendwie beeinflusst. Da werden wir sicherlich auch drüber noch weiter reden bei dieser Reihe und jetzt wünsche ich Ihnen ganz viel Vergnügen bei unserer Lecture-Reihe. Heute machen wir es deutlich kürzer als letztes Mal, versprochen, und jetzt Vincent Zediger, der Kelly Conway vorstellt. Viel Vergnügen. <lacht> Genau, ich werde mich äh, kurz fassen. <lacht> How do you write a book about an artist whose work spans seven decades, covers several art forms from photography to cinema to installation art, who is still alive, uh, who is both very attuned to the work of film scholars and very conscious of her image? This is the question that our guest tonight, Kelly Conway, has just found a brilliant answer to. And the artist in question is, of course, Agnès Varda. Kelly Conway's new book on Varda, which was literally published yesterday, I think. <laughs> the, it's, it, yeah, it's basically, it's still, you know, baking. Uh, <laughs> That book has literally um, been been uh, published by uh, University of Illinois uh, Press, and it's the result of an exhaustive archival research and extensive conversations with uh, Varda um, herself. As such, Con uh, Kelly Conway's book pays tribute to the enormous breadth and variety of Varda's body of work and traces Varda's trajectory from pho photography through cinema to installation art by focusing on five films and uh, Varda's installation work. With this book, which builds on Conway's previous publications on Varda, including several texts on tonight's film, Les Plages d'Agnès, and by the way, Les Plages d'Agnès is also the cover photograph, so uh, it's an important film uh, uh, in this book. Uh, with, this, with this book, uh, Kelly Conway reaffirms her status as one of the most inspiring scholars and film historians working on French cinema today, um, a reputation which she first acquired with her book Chanteuse in the City, published by University of California Press in 2004, which is a study of the figure of the female singer in French cinema from the 1930s onwards. And as we know um, from last week's film, Chain B par Agnès V, And as all those know who are familiar with Varda's Cléo de saint Cassette, which is the story of a popular singer uh, in, in, in Paris in the early 60s, the figure of the chanteuse plays a crucial role in Varda's work as well. So it's perhaps no coincidence that uh, Kelly Conway moved uh, from a book on the chanteuse uh, to writing uh, what is doubtlessly bound to become the text of reference on Varda for the foreseeable uh, future with her latest book. Kelly Conway received her master's degree in communication studies from the University of Iowa, but with a film focus in 1988. Uh, she then moved to Paris and obtained the DEA, which is a diploma that no longer exists, but that's what it used to be called in, 
yeah, it's, well, yeah. In film studies from the Sorbonne Nouvelle Paris 3, which was sort of the hub of film studies in France at the time, still is. And then she went on to earn her PhD in film studies from the University of California at Los Angeles in 1999. Kelly Conway has been a professor of cinema uh, studies at the University of Wisconsin uh, in Madison, which uh, is, you know, to American film studies, what Paris 3 is to French film studies, one of the hubs. And she's been there since 2000. In addition to her two monographs, she has published widely on all aspects, aspects of French cinema and French visual culture, women's history and gender studies. In particular, I want to mention essays on popular song in Jean Renoir, the American reception of Brigitte Bardot, and the multimedia installations of Godard and Varda. Uh, for all those of you who um, want to learn more about, uh, about Kelly Conway's work on Agnès Varda and about the process of writing uh, her book, um, there will be a workshop at the university tomorrow morning in the film room um, in the IG Farben building under the ceiling um, from 10 to 12, where um, uh, Kelly will discuss with students and anyone else who's interested um, uh, the kind of, you know, the, the research that she did and the kind of work that went into writing that book and, and working on Varda. We're very proud that Kelly has uh, accepted our intro, intro, <laughs> invitation and has traveled all the way from Wisconsin. Please welcome, together with me, Kelly Conway. Thank you very much for that beautiful introduction. I'm delighted to be here. This is a gorgeous museum you have. So in, in 2005, I had the great good fortune to eat breakfast with Agnes Varda. We were in Montreal. She was there to participate in a retrospective of her films. And she was also hanging an exhibition of her photographs. We were at her hotel on the second floor. As we were eating, she kept looking out the window where there were many homeless people. And she would put down her fork and say, look at those people. What, what do you think they're carrying in their bags? Many of them were carrying plastic sacks. And then she said, where do you think they sleep at night? This went on and on. Much later, in June 2012, I was in the town of Nantes in France, where Agnès had just finished two multimedia installations. One of them was called Une Chambre, no, La Chambre Occupée. So she was kind of working in, in, in interaction with the films of her late husband, Jacques Demy, who did Une Chambre en Ville, the film. So she did La Chambre Occupée. And Basically, this installation looked like this. It was in a room in, at the very top of a, an important structure called Passage Pomeré. Have you seen Lola? Lola by Jacques Demy? Okay, so you remember. There are very important scenes that take place in Passage Pomeré, this gorgeous 19th century covered archive. So Agnès created this room meant to look like a squat a place where homeless people were staying. As you can see, there is an, a mattress poised, a grocery cart with a microwave in it, and kind of an old-fashioned stove. In each object, kind of domestic object, she placed a video screen. The videos featured homeless people talking about why they are where they are in life. It was um, very um, fragmented um, and moving, these stories of where they came, came from. In effect, the homeless people I saw in Montreal had migrated to Nantes, to this installation. And it was then that I realized that Varda never stops looking thinking, and working. She moves through the world. She looks at people with a rare intensity and empathy. And then she transforms her vision and her emotion into new work. 
For over 60 years, Agnès Varda has been observing others and telling stories about them, first in photographs, then in documentaries and fiction films, and most recently, installations. She also occasionally represents herself. Her first official self-portrait happened in 1954, a mosaic. In 1960, she presented herself in front of a painting by Bellini, <laughs> inserted herself as a character. In 1958, she made a short documentary called L'Opera Mouf. It's really a portrait of a street in Paris called the Rue Mouffetard. But at the beginning of the film, we get these images, moving images, of a nude pregnant woman. And we know, if we have read the subtitle to the film, Notes from the Diary of a Pregnant Woman, that this is, in fact, the body of Agnès Varda. Oops. Um, much later, in 2003, she presented herself surrounded by potatoes. But that's a story for a little bit later. Um, may I have clip one, please? So as you can see already, when she chooses to represent herself in moving images, she does it in a way that is very playful. And in this case, very fragmented. It's full of repetitions. She's making available to you the process of the editor, of the director also, in, in the making of a film. Several takes are shown. Um, sometimes Varda appears in a film in a very displaced fashion, such as in her work Documentaire, which is a film she made while living um, without Jacques Demy. They separated in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, and she lived alone in Los Angeles with her son, Mathieu. So she had just experienced this very painful breakup, and she made a film which she says always is her favorite, is her, her personal favorite of her own films. Um, so could we have the next clip from Documentaire? Okay, so that clip is actually from the film that you will see tonight, Les Plages d'Agnès. I had thought I had taken it from Documentaire, but as you will see when you watch The Beaches of Agnès tonight, Agnès Varda is one of the best analysts of her own films, and you saw already a bit of, of analysis, acknowledging that the character of Émilie was really herself in a certain way. Okay, later... Um, self-portraits of Varda occur in 2003 when she made Patatutopia, which is actually um, an installation that she made for the Venice Biennale. But this still photograph was also produced for the event, kind of a playful representation of herself. She also represented herself at this Biennale uh, while wearing a gigantic potato costume. And she walked around and tried to attract people to her installation, which, ha which was a triptych of moving images of potatoes in various stages of decay. <laughs> so she's not afraid to uh, clown around a bit. She also, of course, appears in her installation, The Widows of Noir Moutier. She is one of the widows who is being uh, represented. OK. However, in 2008, so, there, so I guess what I'm saying is there's no shortage of images of Agnes Varda in the work of Agnes Varda. But in 2008, in her sixth decade of filmmaking, she inserted herself into one of her films in the most direct way yet. She made a full-fledged autobiographical feature documentary, Les Plages d'Agnès. Tonight, I would like to talk about the kind of, of self-portrait that Varda has created with this film. Throughout her long career as a filmmaker, photographer, and visual artist, Agnes Varda has embraced the unknowability of her characters. From the opaque drifter figure in Sans Toi Ni Loi, to the taciturn shopkeepers and neighbors in her film Daguerreotype, Varda has always assumed a position of respectful distance in her portraits of people and places. She never assumes that she knows everything there is to know about someone else. When faced with the challenge of telling her own life story, how does Varda construct the central character herself? 
Let us begin with a poster for the film. For the catalog of her 2006 installations, L'Ile et Elle, Varda had invited <coughs> Christophe Vallot, who is an artist and an animator and a set designer and her good friend, to sketch several caricatures of her, expanding on the playful and self-deprecating ways she had figured in Patatutopia. Vallot created an image in particular, one image in particular, that shows a diminutive, plump Varda perched on a comically high chair, seemingly stranded in low tide at, on the island of Noirmoutier. The text below the image is captioned, Beacons and Lighthouses of France, as though from a coffee table tome of coastal landmarks. The text reads, notable for her cylindrical tower in trapezoidal form with exposed siding and small bags, crowned with red glasses, all on a fragile foundation sporting fabulous Chinese sandals. She remains an outstanding example of maritime architecture, remotely operated from the Rue Daguerre. Currently without caretakers. She is, however, completely unsupervised and may not be visited. The poster for Les Plages, called again on Valo, expanding on this lovable Magoo like caricature and placing her this time on a very high director's chair. Valo's affectionate sketches bear witness to just how recognizable and consistent Varda's image, the Varda look has been over the years. She has gradually evolved from the elfin gamine of the Nouvelle Vague to the punk granny, as she calls herself, of um, independent film and installation art. Her signature bob haircut still frames her intelligent impish face, although, depending on the season and her humor, it can be fully aubergine or half grown out into a two-tone monk's tonsorial fringe with a silvery cap. Her diminutive stature allows the caricaturist to exaggerate her into a plump butterball. Here's another image of Varda. If Varda's appearance seems both negligé and fastidiously soigné, it is emblematic of a paradox in her work. She has deliberately cultivated a down-to-earth persona through years of quietly observant self-portraiture and sympathetic identification with marginal figures, while placing herself resolutely in the center of her work, with the healthy narcissism of an irrepressible artist who must express herself or die. Invitations to participate in biennales and other fine arts exhibitions have reinforced the sense that Varda herself is the brand that is being sought out. And she has played along, offering further declensions of a playful, self-deprecating artist who wants to show us something. There is an urgency about what she wants to show us, however just behind the humorous guise. And that urgency is the fervent belief that what Varda is looking at, what she has spotted, is of true and rare worth, deserving our full attention. She is willing to clown a bit. Here she is in the film that you will see tonight, pretending to be a trapeze artist. But not at the expense of the dignity of her subjects or her attachment to the past. Varda's gift throughout her career, in the most fundamental sense, has been to make us take a look and then take a second look and to oblige our skeptical eyes to take an interest. This is made abundan abundantly clear in Les Plages d'Agnès. Les Plages d'Agnès is, in one sense, a chronicle of the remarkable life of Agnès Varda. In roughly chronological fashion, we learn about her girlhood and adolescence, her education, her sexual coming of age, and her work as a photographer, director, and installation artist. Her account of her life with Jacques Demy includes how she met him, their early years together, their separation in the early 1980s, their reunion 
in the late 1980s and his death in 1990. Chronicling the beaches that have marked her life provides Varda's film with a structure based on geography, a go-to strategy for the filmmaker. This tactic allows Varda to inject the visual variety of multiple locations, offered by the road film once again, taking her viewers from the beaches of her native Belgium to Set in the south of France, where she and her family lived on a boat during World War II, to the island of Noirmoutier, where she and Demi spent their summers, and to Los Angeles, where she lived with Demi in the late 60s and without him in the late 70s. Varda even manages to reimagine her beloved Rue Daguerre um, in the middle of Paris as a kind of beach, thanks to a few tons of sand and the approval of the mayor's office. Despite the film's apparent devotion to chronology and its clearly marked geographical framework, Les Plages d'Agnès is a highly digressive, collage-like autobiography. The film's temporal structure is actually quite loose. Varda's narration moves back and forth through time in unpredictable ways. Likewise, her film extracts and stills do not always correspond to the period being recounted in her life. In the first section on Brussels, for example, where she was a child, um, just as they're getting ready to move to the south of France because Brussels is being bombed, she cuts to a moment in her life when she's in her 20s, in her late 20s, and she's an established filmmaker, and she is being invited to um, an experimental film festival uh, organized by the curator Jacques Ledoux. So she's happy to jump back and forth in time and in location, depending on her needs and her whims. Moreover, for an autobiography, this film concentrates very little on the details of Varda's childhood. In fact, in one early scene, she flatly denies that her childhood inspired her in any way or could provide the key to the person she became. Next clip, please. Anyway, so as you can see, she gets out her old black and white photographs of herself as a child and, but this leads not to any kind of insight as to what her childhood was like or what the influence of it might have been on her. Instead, it leads to, an, to a kind of, to new work. She you know, finds these people who can stand in for herself as a child and has these little children and has them make um, little trinkets on the sand with shells and flowers. So she, she uses this opportunity not to be nostalgic, but to make something new. This refusal to see the past as generating the future in some way is highly unusual in autobiographical filmmaking or writing for that matter. Take for example the um, documentary uh, autobiographical film Tarnation by Jonathan Cowett, a film that Varda admires by the way, in which the director pieces together his childhood and his memories of his mother his very troubled, mentally ill mother, through home movies, telephone messages, and still images. So on the one hand, it's a bit like Varda's film in that it's full of material, um, stills, moving images, etc. But he uses them in a completely different way. Next clip, please. So here in Tarnation, the filmmaker's childhood is retrievable. It's legible. It has explanatory power for what came next. His mother had a very difficult life, and he had a very difficult life. The past in Tarnation lends coherence to the director's life and that of his mother. In contrast, Les Plages d'Agnès focuses most insistently on the present. And it is less a portrait of Varda's childhood, certainly, than a joyous tapestry of her work both past and present. And this is a very important kind of rhetorical decision on her part, to make the film about her work rather than her childhood. To my mind, the film's most distinctive rhetorical strategy is indeed the emphasis on Varda at work. Before we see any childhood photographs or any clips from the films that she would later make, we see her with her assistants um, creating an installation involving mirrors on a beach in Belgium. 
This was the very first gesture of the film, by the way. When she started thinking about making this film, at a certain moment, her friend was going to make it about her, her friend Didier Rouget, who, who shot the first scene. So they went to these beaches in Belgium. She brought a crew with her, and they arranged these mirrors. She created an installation on the beach, and he filmed her. Later, she decided there was no way she could let anyone else make her film. You know, she had to do it. So, I mean, as, as positive as the experience had been, she realized she, this needed to be her film. But I think it's interesting and important that the very first gesture um, in the making of this film was the creation of an installation, not any kind of retrieval mechanism of the past. So the film's pre-credit sequence then shows Varda and her assistants creating this complex installation. Okay, next clip, please. So the scene provides an idea, first of all, of how Varda works with confidence, with authority, with humor. Um, and also, you see when the scarf flies over her face, you get a hint that she's not interested in total transparency in her autobiography. She likes the idea that something could cover her face, provide a barrier between her and the viewer. The mirrors have, of course, both literal and conceptual functions, conjuring up Varda's memories about the mirrored armoire in her parents' bedroom, but also serving as an apt metaphor for the autobiographical story she is about to tell. Mirrors, like all autobiographies, can reflect people and landscapes with reasonable fidelity, yet they can also fragment and distort. Varda's conviction that autobiography is inevitably fragmentary is thus conveyed right from the start of her film. It is articulated later in the film even more directly. She goes to Avignon where um, they're hanging a show of her photographs. Her, one of her first professional experiences was to be a photographer for a theater called the Théâtre National Populaire. And so Avignon, where this theater festival began, put up all of her best photographs of the actors that she took. Her job was to document each and every production, the actors, the costumes, the decor. One of the photographs is a fragmented photo of Gérard Philippe, the French actor, and Varda has fragmented it in this very precise way. She's divided it into parts. An act that prompts her to muse about fragmentation and to ask, is reconstruction even possible? Such scenes emphasize what Dominique Bluer has called the fragmented, multiple, and decentered representations of Varda herself. So by the end of the prologue of Les Plages d'Agnès, it is apparent that Varda is less interested in excavating some definitive, coherent version of herself from the past than she is in engaging in the creation of new work, a series of highly stylized, um, installation-like scenes that represent her memories or fantasies. Now, we could isolate many strategies she uses to this effect, but I will focus on just two. One is the extension or reworking of one of her films. That's one of the functions of the staged scenes. And the second is the visual realization of a long-held fantasy. So she's either working to extend or think about a work that she has made in the past, or she's trying to create a fantasy, realize a fantasy that she's had. Such scenes of reenactment possess a variety of connections to her films and her life history, and they are rarely simple. For example, in the clip I'm going to show you next, watch how she narrates her family's move from the south of France to Paris at the end of World War II. We see several shots of Varda in 2008 navigating a boat through the canals of the town of Set, where she spent her adolescence, and then there's a cut and she's in Paris, still in her boat. So the idea is that she's, you know, sailed all the way through France to arrive in Paris. Okay, next clip, please. So, 
As you can see, the scene does not really exactly reenact something that happened in Varda's past, although she did learn how to sail in set. Rather, the scene is a witty and elegant transition from one part of Varda's life to the next, as well as an imaginary extension of the final shot of her first film, which she herself tells us. As I said, she's the best analyst of her own work. She leads us through this very carefully. It is also evidence of Varda's extraordinary vitality at wit and wit at the age of 80 that she could sail this boat while navigating the Seine. The scene is thus anything but a simple transition from one chapter of her life to the next, employing graphic matches, right? The boat moves from the foreground to the background while a train moves screen right in both the scene from La Pointe Courte and the contemporary moment of Varda in Paris. You saw that, no doubt, the repetition of the, the graphic qualities. So it, it creates that very satisfying match. But it also illustrates her family's 1944 move from set to Paris, using both the final shot of her first film, shot in 1954, and then footage shot in both set and Paris in 2008. Another scene in Les Plages d'Agnès that builds upon an element of one of her films occurs in the section on the 1976 documentary about her neighborhood, Daguerreotype. Next clip, please. Okay, so here what Varda has done is she has melded the production history of this film, telling us about the constraint that she imposed upon herself of not shooting more than 80 meters from her house, with the history of her motherhood, Perhaps I wasn't ready to cut the uh, cord with my baby. But she has also done another thing, which she does throughout the film, is she's mixed her old filmmaking, evidence of her old films, with um, interesting digital filmmaking strategies of the present. So here you could tell that she creates a kind of palimpsest, right? We see the images from Daguerreotype, but really worked on with digital tools to create um, a very dense kind of image of the past and the present. Another staged scene, a trapeze performance, is neither a reconstructed memory nor an extension of one of her films, but rather the realization of a fantasy Varda had while a young girl. Her voiceover tells us, as a teenager, I would dream of joining a circus. I knew nothing of life. And then the film's brisk editing paces, pace slows way down so the troupe can perform its show. Um, I'm hesitant to show you this because I kind of want this to be a surprise. It's so beautiful. Am I giving too much away about this film? <laughs> Maybe I'll skip, I'll skip that clip, huh? So basically, what interests me about it, though, is um, the elaborate quality of it. She hired trapeze artists to establish their apparatus on the beach, and then she films them with both still and moving images in this way that is absolutely stunning. The other thing that is interesting about that, actually, could we see the first 15 seconds of that clip? Is that possible? Just like the first 15 seconds, yeah. So what we saw there is, first of all, the, a fairly traditional tactic in any documentary, a talking head, um, the widow of Jean Villard, André Villard, is talking to Varda about her love of poetry and um, she's quoting a poem, and then we move to a painting of a landscape that was important to Varda, and then to a still from Varda's documentary, Ulysse, a film she made in the 1980s, combined with some digital effect that makes it look like there's an ocean at the back of the photograph. So this scene uh, concludes, it, then, then we go on to see this elaborate um, trapeze performance demonstrating her long-held fantasy. So the one thing I want to show you about that right away is that this film is heavily dependent upon editing that is fast and associative, right? So the links between shots are not always um, continuous. They're not about establishing some kind of coherent, continuous sense of space. On the contrary, she loves discontinuity in this film. And often the only thing that attaches shots together is some association. It can be visual or it can be verbal or both. Like the hook that she uses uh, varies. The result 
overall is a collage effect or even a kaleidoscopic effect that results in a kind of tour of Varda's life work. One might have expected Varda to do something else with this film. Um, for example, she might have decided to explore in detail the complex relationship she shared with Jacques Demy, who died in 1990 from complications relating to AIDS. But she avoids completely the narrative of personal crisis or sexual secrets in favor of an exploration of her past work and an occasion to generate new work. She wants to instead memorialize her diverse oeuvre and emphasize her status as a working, ever-evolving artist. Crucially, Varda never hides the staged nature of her scenes. Um, she's not at all interested in presenting something that feels um, totally authentic and accurate and factual. And this is very different from the choices that most autobiographical filmmakers make. I'm thinking specifically about the film um, Stories We Tell by Sarah Pauly, made in 2013. She took a very different strategy. The film appears to be comprised of a traditional mix of talking head interviews and home footage, but the film strategically conceals the staged status of approximately half of its lovingly reenacted home footage until late in the film. And it's a shock to the viewer because you believe that it's all real. Um, Varda, in contrast, from the very beginning of this film, foregrounds the nature, the performative nature of the act of telling one's life story. She accomplishes this at times by simply speaking to the camera directly, but more often through the staging of a scene from the past, or as you just will see, the reenactment of a fantasy, such as the trapeze scene. Moreover, she uses many avatars to represent herself at different stages of her life. You saw already the little girls playing on the beach, representing her as a young child. Later, we'll see a singing school child um, in her gingham, um, gingham pinafore in the town of Set, singing a song during the occupation. Later, we see a 20-year-old woman who looks very much like Varda did at that age, writing the screenplay for her first film and mending a fishing net in Corsica. The staged scenes don't feel like concealment or falsehood. They seem, um, in contrast, celebratory of Varda's artistry and her imagination. Again and again, we are made to feel Varda's exhilaration in departing from a strictly chronological, evidence-based account of her life. The repeated gesture of walking backwards on a beach exemplifies this performative, playful impulse. Walking backwards is, of course, meant to indicate Varda's numerous journeys back in time, but she actually moves freely, both backward and forward, from memory to fantasy, in vertiginous, propulsive fashion. Such techniques move the film away from um, documentaries that we would call observational. For example, the documentaries of the American Frederick Wiseman or the French documentary maker um, Nicolas Philibert, who did um, the charming documentary about the school. Uh, instead, Varda should be placed more in the category of the poetic documentary maker. I think of her uh, alongside the Canadian filmmaker Guy Madden with films like My Winnipeg, uh, made in 2007, which is, which is his wry autobiographical documentary that combines archival footage with staged footage to evoke his family history and his hometown of Winnipeg. In addition to the overt staging in Les Plages d'Agnès, Varda used another conceptual tool in planning the film, the database. In interviews about the film, she states that she thought of her entire filmography as a vast database that she could use in her autobiographical film. Accordingly, she accesses this database of clips with great liberty and agility to narrate her professional and personal trajectory. So such a conception leads to a heterogeneous fractured film edited with very careful attention to create 
very pleasing graphic matches and um, associative, associative logic. This intensification of, of associative editing, it's something she's used for many years now, reflects the ease of digital tools. As with The Gleaners and I, her first film shot digitally, Varda shot lots of material for Les Plages d'Agnès. It took her over two years to make this film, and her working process was very interesting. She would write a text, shoot, and then come back to her studio, her production company, Cine Tamaris, and work with her editors. She had hired two editors to make the film. It was, so, it was a lot of editing work. And then she would reflect and let it rest, let it, and let herself think. And then she would start again, and she would go out and shoot more, and then write more, and then re-edit and edit additional scenes. So all of this um, is made more possible, of course, with digital tools. If you are uh, shooting something in 35 millimeter, you know, it's not necessarily very economical to shoot in fits and starts over the course of many years. You need to get it done in 12 weeks or something. Um, finally, a major influence on this style in Les Plages d'Agnès is, of course, her work on installations. Um, installations have changed Varda's aesthetic, I would say. Um, on the one hand, certain things that you will see in tonight's films have always been in Varda's films. One, of course, is the importance of place. Critics and historians um, cannot talk about Varda without talking about her investment in certain places. Paris, Set, Los Angeles, Noir Moutier. Her, or even you think about the film saint ni lois or Vagabond, how that film is unimaginable um, elsewhere than where it was shot. So place remains important. It, indeed, it structures Les Plages d'Agnès. Um, but other things seem fresh and new here. First of all, she's rethinking the screen. What can a screen be? Um, she's rethinking the spectator or the viewer. How can I affect the experience that the viewer has of what I am showing him or her? There's a renewed sense of play. There's some, this, the film that you'll see tonight is very joyous, joyous and playful. And finally, um, she's very interested in, in recycling, even more so than she has been in the past. I mean, one example of her recycling would be, if you've seen The Gleaners and I, you know that part of that film is about industrial farming and the scandal around the wasting of potatoes. So after she made that film, in which she filmed many potatoes, she became very interested in potatoes and kept a lot of them in her basement and watched them change and germinate with time. And that's how the installation Patatutopia emerged. That's just one tiny example of how she recycles ideas and objects. That process was intensified. Okay, so in, th as a result of working with her installations, so, but first let me say a bit about her play with screens. Um, she's, of course, filmmakers are used to being confined to a rectangular shaped two-dimensional screen for, for their canvas. But with installations, she has reveled in the fact that she can make many screens. So with Triptych of Noir Moutier, um, it's three screens, but it can be fewer, it can be one if, if you choose to close the, uh, the shutters on the side, you can just look at the interior shot of this domestic scene. If you choose to open the screens on the side, you will be able to see the characters going off screen, as it were, into another screen, walking on the beach, or the grandmother figure will often put dishes away in a china cupboard off to the right. When I saw this installation at the Fondation Cartier in 2006, Agnes Varda walked in and said to the viewers, don't forget, you can close these shutters if you want, or you can open them. Like She really wanted us to understand that this was an installation that had multiple possibilities with regard to how the screens worked. Here's another example of screen play. Um, she did a, a beautiful installation called The Great Postcard, or Souvenirs of Noir Moutier, which is a combination of, on the one hand, a kind of 1950s style pinup um, topped with the face of her own daughter, Rosalie Varda, on, on the body of, of another image, a, a postcard, layered with a beautiful image of, of a woman named Dorothée Blanc, who was in Clio from five to seven, 
and then a little um, touristic image uh, of the Isle of Noirmoutier. But if viewers wanted to, they could approach this console and push buttons and open up additional screens on the postcard and see other kinds of footage. Some of this footage was very funny, like it was of children playing and playing dirty jokes on one another. Other footage was very sad, very nostalgic. We can see the hand, if you know her work well, you can recognize the hand of Jacques Demy raking the sand near the end of his life. So very, a mixture of joyous and melancholic images. Another way of manipulating the screen occurred in Route de Gua, same installation series, Lille et Elle. This is all from Lille et Elle, the 2006 show that she had at the Fondation Cartier. This installation was comprised of a, of a rubber curtain that you could walk through and pretend to enter the island of Noirmoutier, a place that was very important to her. But if you got there at the wrong time, you had to wait because what she did was recreate a road that is submersible. You, you can't enter the island unless it's low tide. So if that, if that bar was there, you had to stop and wait for six minutes and watch the video on the screen. So in that way, Varda manipulated her viewer's trajectory through the show. Here she multiplies the screens even more. We have 14 screens of widows telling their stories and then a big, beautiful 35 millimeter image in the middle of the screens in which abstract figures of widows move around an empty dining room table on the beach. Um, you would sit down in a chair and put on the headphones and listen to a story. And if you wanted to hear another story, you would move chairs, change chairs, and, and hear another story. So here she's really kind of organizing the viewer's movement in a way through the space. And she's, of course, mixing celluloid and digital video in a very interesting way. She hired um, a cinematographer called Eric Gautier, a very well-respected DP, to film that middle image. She wanted it to be gorgeous. Here's also from Les Veuves de Noirmoutier. And finally, um, as an example of her um, recycling strategies in, her, in the age of her installations, here's an example of what she did with a film that was considered a commercial failure. In 1966, she made a film with Catherine Deneuve and Michel Piccoli, kind of a hybrid science fiction art film called Les Créatures. The film didn't earn a lot of money at the box office, but she decided to recycle the prints by creating a structure around them. And one could go into this little shack and sit. You were invited to sit and contemplate the world while sitting on cans of film. It's completely beautiful. She, she ends the film sitting in her little cabin. OK. In conclusion, if one of Varda's major career goals has been to make us look at people, often marginalized characters, such as Mona in saint ni lois and ask us to recognize their complexity and their humanity and their ultimate unknowability, um, her autobiographical documentary extends this strategy. But this time, the unknowable character is, of course, Agnès Varda. Les Plages d'Agnès chronicles not Varda the person as much as Varda the filmmaker or Varda the, film, the, the artist. Through constant references to her films and how they came about, through the playful scenes of staging and reenactment, through references to the latest phase in her career, that of visual artist, Les Plages d'Agnès ultimately celebrates Varda's ways of looking and working. The film also resolutely insists that Varda's career is not over. To live is to create for Agnes Varda. Cinema is indeed her home, as she says at the very end of the film, implying that she will continue to look at other people and other places and share her visions with us. Thank you. So that was the most expensive part of the production, obviously. She had to hire this troupe of trapeze artists and a, um, she had to build a big structure that the camera could sit on because she wanted the backdrop to be the ocean. 
she wanted to be really high so that when they flew through the air, all you could see was the ocean and the sky. So it was significant. This film was not inexpensive. It was about two million euros to make, which is a lot for a documentary in Europe. It's, for, I think, a, the average price of a feature fiction film in 2008 in Europe was about five and a half million. So it was kind of a lot of money, but it did well at the box office. You know. Not that she usually, she doesn't make films to have them be commercially successful, but in order to keep going, to keep doing the work that she does, it helps if they're a little bit successful. Fragen können Sie in uh, der Sprache Ihrer Präferenz stellen. Deutsch, Französisch, Italienisch. Uh, und ich versuche es dann zu übersetzen und Kelly wird auf Englisch antworten. Ja, um, yeah, Mark, please. What? <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for playing <laughs> along, Please, man. Somebody ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, ju I um, one of the things I, I really in enjoyed about your talk was um, <clears throat> was um, the the connections you were making between her films and her installations, um, which which recalled also um, now to talk to you about a lecture you didn't hear. Um, which was Vincent Heidegger's lecture last week, where he talked about Jane B. by Agnes V. as um, in relation to the the sketch, the portrait, the um, um, and uh, and forth, the uh, development of something to come. Blueprint. Blueprint. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so there's a sense that it, one film kind of leads into the next film. But with what you're talking about is a similar thing of a kind of bleeding and opening, um, but in relation to installation work. And I just wonder if you have some thoughts about that. I think you mentioned before that, that we can mark a change in her mm -hmm. career when she started doing this. Yes. I Could think, you talk a little bit more about sure. this? I think on the one hand, uh, so I just watched last night, I rewatched Jane B. by Agnes V. because I learned that you had seen this last week, or some of you have seen Jane B. And I thought, I wonder if, there, if there's anything interesting I can say. And I was startled at how... Um, how much Jane B. anticipates the beaches of Agnes, because of course it's a hybrid film, right? It's on the one hand, it's a documentary or kind of a biopic of Jane Birkin, but laced with um, clips, uh, staging of action of films that she did not make, but might have wanted to make, right? And there's, so the equivalent would be, it's, it's a very digressive, fragmented film, just as Les Plages d'Agnes. But I think one thing that makes it different is, I mean, Jane B. is a radical film. I love it, actually. Um, I would say it's a tiny bit more conventional in the sense that when Agnes cuts to digressive material, the kind of imagined films, they're more likely to be genre films, like The Policier. Jane Birkin ha has a gun. She's like a femme fatale. Do you remember that scene? Or Jane Birkin is Joan of Arc, or Jane Birkin is, you know, someone else. But, and in The Beaches of Agnes, the digressive material is more likely to be completely invented things, like the trapeze artist. She's not interested in any kind of generic codes or play in Les Plages d'Agnes. Whereas in Jane B, she is. But that said, Jane B is still a radical film. I think about Varda's play with paintings in that film. Her insistence upon posing Jane B. Um, Jane, B pl Jane Birkin plays sometimes two different characters in a film. Remember the squabbling servant girl, the rebellious servant, and the... Um, what is, you know what I'm talking about? The woman, the painting in which she's laying down on a chaise lounge. Yeah, the, um, um, uh, the Titian's, uh, Titian's the, um, the Venus of Orbino. The Venus, yeah. And where, where she plays the, the, the commerto for the, the, the sermon as well as Venus. The Venus, right. So there's this extraordinary playfulness. And of course, in both films, she's very interested in painting. In all of her films, Varda is interested in painting. Um, why? Well, Partly, there's a biographical reason for it. When she was growing up, her, her father was a businessman, and he cared nothing for art. 
Her mother, on the other hand, loved art, and she spent all of her free time taking on yes to museums and looking at, she had a big collection of art books in the house. And Agnès Varda's early education as a college student was at the École du Louvre. She studied to be a, a curator at the École du Louvre. She, she stopped because she decided she wanted to become a photographer. But so painting is a big reference for her. And you can see it, well, when you see Les Plages d'Agnès, you will see that she uses painting to establish her her patrimoine, her, her patrimony, the th like her artistic heritage. It's not other films. She never says, ah, oh, I loved the work of Rossellini or Visconti or Renoir. No, she was not a cinephile. She claims that she only saw 10 films before she made her own first film. It's possible, I guess. Um, but for her, she always, like rhetorically, she does this thing in her autobiography, her written autobiography, and her filmed autobiography, in which she identifies her artistic lineage as being that of painters. The Renaissance, uh, Picasso, that is how she wants us to think of her, as somebody who is the kind of granddaughter of Picasso. I mean, she's not that, in a more modest way, you know. She's not that, you know, vain that she would say, I am Picasso, no. But she really, that's where she, claims she drew her artistic sustenance. So in that sense, I think Jane B. is quite similar to Les Plages in that it acknowledges this kind of artistic context as opposed to a cinephilic context. I don't know. I'm interested in what you think about Jane B., though, because actually very little has been written about this film in English. You need uh, to we, write we just decided to change that. Yeah. You needed to change that. And you too. Um, but so I'm curious if any of you saw that film last week, what you thought about it. You? Okay. Well, um, just in uh, reference what you said, at least there were at least two filmic references in it um, uh, Laura and Hardy. Right. And Marilyn Monroe, of course. Right. Uh, How to Marry a Millionaire. So. Uh, so. Definitely. <laughs> that's true. But that's different. I mean, when you think about this woman who who was associated with the Nouvelle Vague, which is itself this extraordinary cinephilic moment, it's a moment built upon the Cinémathèque, screenings at the Cinémathèque Française, the, the founding of the journal Cahiers du Cinéma. All these, that's the standard story of the new wave. Truffaut, Godard, Chabrol, Romer, Rivette went to the cinema every day, they wrote about it, and, but she doesn't fit that narrative at all. So um, her references are a little bit offbeat, right? Laurel and Hardy, that's kind of strange. Who, who associates Varda with Laurel and Hardy? Nobody, or Marilyn Monroe, you know. Maybe that was Jane Birkin's idea, though. What do you think? But it, it, the, the, I mean, the references are yeah. offbeat. They're strange. Uh, They're not I really... I think uh, that it fits very well that she chose um, uh, Marilyn Monroe because she has this in the beginning this um, um, reference to that that she's not looking in the camera. Yes. And this is uh, like in Marilyn Monroe. I mean, the most famous thing about the bio biography or writing about Marilyn Monroe is that there's a difference between Norma Jean and Marilyn Monroe. Yeah. And who's the real Marilyn Monroe? And that she's not looking into the camera. And yeah. That she always kind of trying to avoid to avoid it yeah. yes that's an interesting point yeah well the film is kind of a meditation on stardom isn't it mm -hmm. the gap between jane burke and the star and jane burke and on the street and she herself is ambivalent you know she says i want to be i want to be an ordinary person filmed in my garden but Agnes says to her but you also want to play the star you know yeah. just just a, a, a very brief interjection about cinephilia cinephilia is for boys it's it's essentially uh, a boys club affair um, and uh, Lauren Hardy and, and Marilyn Monroe I would say are not cinephilic references in the sense that they would somehow refer to the canon of French cinephilia. Chaplin is canonical. Um, Lauren Hardy not so much but it's cinema and it's, it's popular culture and, and so uh, for her to make reference to Lauren Hardy rather than then Chaplin is also a statement about the cinephilic canon. Indeed. 
Did you have a question? Yes, there's a question. You are, no question. You asked for a comment on, on the film um, we saw two weeks ago. Uh, for me, this film has always been very important, not just this film, um, Jane B., but also the other works of Agnes Varda when I studied film long ago. Um, for me, that film was especially important because it's a film between two women. It talks a lot, um, also visual, about erotic um, errors and sexuality, but not directed to men. They, def uh, they define sexuality and eros in a completely new, unspectacular, very authentic female way. And this uh, is a great power for me in that film. Ja, das ist jetzt vielmehr eine Frage an Sie, weil ich glaube jetzt nicht, dass die Dame das beantworten kann. Und zwar, ähm, ja gut, ähm, es geht darum, ich meine, Sie sind ja Filmprofessor, oder? Und ähm, also ich interessiere mich schon noch so für, sage ich mal, Avantgarde-Filme oder ältere Filme oder so, aber ähm, es ist schwer irgendwie gerade online oder so etwas zu finden oder ähm, wie soll ich sagen, in Programmkinos äh, kann man sich die Filme natürlich anschauen, aber sie gibt es kaum auf DVD, äh, geschweige denn irgendwo online oder so. Ähm, ich weiß nicht, gibt es so eine Art Fernleihe für Filme oder was soll man machen oder was kann man machen, wenn man, sagen wir mal, irgendeinen so französischen Film aus den 50er Jahren schauen will? Yeah, uh, the, 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 the lady's asking about access to films such as Vardos films or other um, rare French French films. Um, <coughs> you can go, man kann, zu, man kann ins Archiv gehen, aber Vardos uh, Gesamtwerk ist mittlerweile auf DVD ediert. It's pretty much edited. And, and there's, a, there's also a, a DVD edition of all the Californian films. Yeah, um, so the great thing about Anya's Varda, among other things, is that she's her um, supplemental material that she creates for the DVD, the, those are extraordinary. So mm. she, I think in 2011, she came out with a boxed set, so her complete oeuvre. But she added little video introductions and other things like analyses of her films. Like she does an analysis of Saint Antoine ni Loi in which she explains the 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 13 traveling shots that she makes. Do you remember those in Vagabond? Gee, so it's worth it to get the box set because there's a lot of extra material. She loves making supplements. And she's a bit of a, she's, she's very, I don't want to say pedantic. She's like, she's got the gift of pedagogy. She likes to teach people about her films and you see those in the supplements. The other thing is if you're, if you're a researcher and I'm assuming most of you are, The beautiful thing about Agnes Varda is that she saves everything. She, in her archive, she has kept everything, both for her career and the career of Jacques Demy. Stills, screenplays, promotional material, um, everything. She's a pack rat. Do you have the, you have this concept in German? She keeps everything, and so and it's a, still a privately held archive. But um, if you establish a correspondence with her, you know, chances are she will let you look at things. It's very rare, right? Many filmmakers are casual about main maintaining their archive. She is not. So that's, it's a gift, really, that she's left to film historians. Other questions? Yeah, please. <coughs> um. Ähm, was, ich mich, was mich gerade irgendwie brennend interessiert, ist eigentlich die Frage, ähm, also zum Beispiel von anderen neorealistischen Regisseuren, also zum Beispiel von Godard oder so, der hat sich viele Gedanken darüber gemacht, in was für einer Zeit er sich befindet. Und ich frage mich, was die was Agnes Wada über die heutige Zeit, in der wir uns jetzt befinden, denkt. Also im, im Sinne von politischen Stellungnahmen? Und ja, politisch beziehungsweise, ja, oder 
ja, vielleicht politisch oder auch ähm, in, im gesamten Kontext hm. äh, der Weltgeschichte, keine Ahnung, wo, wo sie diese, diese Zeit einordnet oder okay. wie, wie sie in die Zukunft auch blickt, zum Beispiel in, ihre, in die nächste Generation oder hm. wie sie vielleicht nicht mehr erlebt, was, was ihre Nachwelt, was das betrifft. Okay. So the question is, um, what, it, it, what's Vardos sense of history and of the current state of society and how does she see her place or the place of art in society and how does she project that into the future? That's a really good question. I think she is concerned about how she is representing um, political and historical phenomena. Um, in this film, Les Plages d'Agnès, she acknowledges that For, for example, one of the things she does in this film that's different from what she has done in the past is acknowledge herself um, as being a part of a feminist um, history. So she did a lot of research with the help of an assistant on feminist theory and feminist activism for Les Plages d'Agnès, and she situates herself in it by saying, you know, once... Um, I signed a petition. There was a famous petition in the 1970s signed by French women who were insisting upon reproductive rights and the right to a safe abortion. Agnès Varda was involved in that, along with Catherine Deneuve and Delphine Serigue. And so you see footage in the film of them marching. And she, she admits that her house, her home, was used as a space for clandestine secret abortions. So she has never done that before, except in, in 1975, she made a film called One Sings, the Other Doesn't, L'une Chante, L'Autre Pas, which is a feminist musical. But that's fiction, and it's, it's very different. She goes to great lengths to announce herself as a feminist in Les Plages d'Agnès. I think it's really important in this film, and it feels new. Like all of a sudden, she's saying to herself, this is part of my history also. Um, and she also, in... Um, You know, after she made this film, Les Plages d'Agnès, she made a five-part series for Arte called Agnès de ci, de la, Varda. Agnès here and there. Agnès Varda here and there. And it's basically a chronicle of her trip around the world, interacting with artists and visiting art galleries and other things. And in that film, she says, in the television series, she says, so many terrible things are going on in the world. And you see footage of bombs, war, refugees. And she says, am I wrong to be making this work when so many terrible things are going on? So she, I think she felt the need to justify to her audience that in a time of war and economic crisis and refugee crisis, we still need beauty and she's going to try to create some of it. But she's, she's sensitive about it. For example, she, she, I don't know if you know that she made a short film for the Venice Film Festival. Called, I think it was called Les Trois Boutons. It was a, a fashion, it was something about fashion. I haven't seen it yet. It's about um, Michu Prada, Prada. And um, people, reporters said, oh, are you, are you interested in fashion? And she felt the need to say, no, I'm not interested in fashion. Heaven forbid. You know. Because she, I think on some level, she knew it would be sort of politically incorrect. Like she's, she knows that, or maybe she worried. I, I, don't, I can't speak for her. But she is aware of what is appropriate and pressing and important and worthy of her acknowledgement, and what is not. So she tries, of course, like all public people, to shape her persona in a way that that feels right to her. And I think she's aware of, of course she's aware of politics and, and history, but her films don't often um, directly talk about them, except Cuba. I mean, have you seen Salut les Cubains? Salut les Cubains. Okay, so in the early 60s, she, along with Alain René and Chris Marker, went to Cuba. Um, to She wanted to photograph Fidel Castro and the people of Cuba. And she made a beautiful film about it, comprised of about a thousand still images. It's in her boxed set. Now, in um, November, like next week, there will be a show at Centre Georges Pompidou 
in Paris on Varda and Cuba. It's one. It's going to be interesting, I think. Yeah. But so that's an example of how she interacted directly with a very important political moment. Mm. Yeah, but mm. I understood your anvo- your answer before. Um, you need beauty. Yeah. It's uh, thank you. Yeah. Oh. Thank you for the answer. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all need it more than ever. I mean, there's there's also the Black Panther film. Of course, oh yeah, of course, is, of course. Uh, how could I have forgotten that? So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, uh, I was thinking about the clip we could see, the last one, and I found it very beautiful how she connected the safety net with the hem- hammock. Hammock, thank you. And the fishing <laughs> net. And the fishing net. And this was this kind of like an association. Um, and I was wondering whether there's more of this kind of connecting uh, yes. in the film. Yes, there much of the editing relies upon graphic connections between shots. So it, you're exactly right. The net, the safety net, the net that hides the lovers, all of this is mm-hmm. her way of um, connecting. Did you see also the cape that she's w- that the trapeze artists are wearing? Their beautiful red capes. Sometimes the movement of the cape through the air is what connects one shot to the next. And then there's another shot of her making uh, an installation on a beach of, of this big whale. And there too, like cloth flying through the air is what connects those two sections. So yeah, she's, I think more than ever, she is free to make visual connections between shots that sometimes don't have anything to do with logic, but have everything to do with a kind of aesthetic pleasure that we get from one shot following the next. She's always interested in editing, though. You remember saint ouen lois Vagabond? Do you remember there are these 13 beautiful tracking shots of Mona, Sandrine Bonner, walking, walking through the landscape? She added them late into the process of making the film. She was already shooting the film, and she said, I'm, I'm doing something wrong here. What is not coming across is that this is a film about Mona walking more than about other people talking about Mona. So she added these beautiful tracking shots that do not advance the narrative. They're not causal. They do not have a causal logic. They don't cause anything to happen. They're strictly speaking unnecessary for the clarity of the plot. But they're there and they remind us that she's walking all the time. And at the end of each of those shots, Varda stops her camera on something um, some kind of object in the landscape, maybe a, a rusty tractor, a, a piece of machinery, a gate, um, a fence. And then then she goes back to the story of Mona. And then five minutes later, we have another tracking shot, and she will continue. She will make a graphic match from the other tracking shot to this one. Do you see what I mean? Very, even if no spectator could ever remember that, you wouldn't remember it if it happened five minutes ago. But she says, I know it's there. The graphic match is there, and it was intentional. She's, she's very interested in, in editing always. But I think with digital tools, her the speed with which she can edit and experiment has changed. I should calculate the average shot length of her films. If I were David Bordwell, <laughs> I would have done that already. David is my colleague back in Madison. And he, of course, became famous for, among other things, engaging in quantitative, kind of, you know, statistical analysis of, of editing, counting the number of, ca- calculating the average shot length of a film. If I were to do that, I'm sure we would discover that it, it has gone down in Vardis films since 2000. Yeah. Um, I just briefly want to come back we're, we're going to go to the screening right away okay. this. Uh, but I just briefly want to come back to the logic of the palimpsest that you talked about uh, and the, the beautiful sequence with the cable yep. and, and the various uh, images from Daguerreotype uh, imprinted on uh, the image of her doing this and um, <clears throat> you said that you know the logic that that this film is in a way a palimpsest of Jane B. Paranias V. Yes. Um, and you could actually go even further and say Jane B. Paranias V is a palimpsest of Cleo in 
in that, you know, it's also a film about a singer and, yes. and it's very much about just basically interacting with... Uh, and it's a profile the, of a woman also. I mean, yeah. getting back to your point about the importance of Varda telling stories about women, taking the time to tell non-standard, mm. complex stories about women, it's something we can't take for granted. Right. <laughs> right. But yeah, that's a good link from Cleo to Jane B to this. And of course, mm. she is her own central female character this exactly. time. Exactly. And I think yeah. it's important to, to repeat one point that you made, that um, Varda completely does away with the conventional uh, structures of, of the biographic narrative, which is always, there's always something that happened in childhood that explains everything, you know. Greta he, Garbo, it's eating oranges and reading under the blanket when she was a, when she was a girl. And, and, and if you read standard biographies, there's always on the first 10 pages, there's this moment that's the key to everything, and she completely rejects that kind of narrative. Yeah. Um, and instead, and uh, as as you as you succinctly pointed out, uh, it's basically it's a portrait of the artist as an old lady. Exactly. Uh, and 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 she's 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 interested in portraying herself, creating. Yes, she's not interested in in unearthing a sad, secretive story a tell-all story about her yeah, youth this like, is why i'm so miserable right or, or yeah. i think about a film another film that's so different from hers made a year later and she liked this film too did you ever see iran by alain cavalier do you know who cavalier is he's huh. he made le filmeur also he makes these very personal beautiful films about himself and other people but um it's all about the tragedy of his life and how he lost Irene, his wife, Irene, and he, he tries to make a documentary about her and their, their marriage, but he can't. The whole film is about how he can't make the film. He falls down the stairs in the metro and breaks his leg. He breaks out in hives from stress. His skin gets broken out due to stress. The whole film is about paralysis and inaction and misery. <laughs> and it could not be more different from Varda, whose film is about ongoing activity and joy and gratitude. She thanks people throughout the film, which I kind of love. She's sort of like, she was just turning 80 and she didn't know how much time she would have left to live. Luckily, she's still here and still working. But this film was like a chance for her to to say thank you to all the people who had made her life possible. It's kind of a beautiful gesture. At, at, any, event, at any event, it's about joy. And it's very different from usu the usual autobiographical film. The kind of secretive, this is when things went wrong. Mm. So. And of course, she has had things that have gone wrong, right? Everybody has. She could tell many complex, melancholic stories. Her marriage was very complicated. She chooses not to. Interestingly, she represents sex in a very interesting way. When you see the film next Wednesday, watch for this. I wish we could talk about this. Um, you will see, you saw it already, the nude couple on the beach. That's the way to represent what she did not know about sex. Later, you will see her representing her sexual life with Jacques Demy by having two nude people, two actors from the adult what we call the adult film industry, two por porn porn graphic actors. porn, yeah. <laughs> two actors naked in her courtyard, um, wearing these white hoods over their head, as if they were in a Magritte painting, René Magritte. She references again another yeah. reference to painting. Yeah. So she she finds ways to represent her love life, her her sex life with Jacques Demy, but it's very distant and stylized. It's quite interesting. There's there's one last little point I want to talk about. Okay. <laughs> and then we'll go to this. Okay. Thing. Um, there's something that I will provisionally call the the Varda mirror. Uh, and you were talking about the importance of screens and, and how she works with screens in her installations. But you also showed one shot from Agnès from the opening scene where she puts all these screens, uh, all, the, all the mirrors on... On, on the beach, and then there's this one shot where you have a mirror, and you see a mirror inside the mirror, yes. framed, and there's a young man walking towards us in that mirror. Yes. And it's very complicated to figure out where 
in the real you space. Can, you cannot figure out you the cannot space. figure out that. And it and, gets it gets more and more and more complicated yes. as the scene goes on. Yeah. Yeah. There's a similar shot in in uh, in Cleo that I showed last week, and we just uh, and we talked about uh, the, the 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 hat the hat shop the hat shop yeah where you have this the the two uh, mirrors uh, one behind each other, and and they move around the shop and they reappear in the mirrors and it's very difficult to locate the source of the image in the yeah. mirror so the mirror becomes a screen yes. that actually produces and projects its own image yes and, I, and it's it's a unique um uh, feature that i've never seen i mean you know mirrors abound in the cinema mm -hmm. but this kind of mirror that's a screen uh i've never seen yeah, nor have I. It's it's an important motif for her. And also in Cleo, you see another use of the mirror. Do you remember in the cafe? Um, yeah. Two cafe scenes. In the first I cafe that scene, one too. <laughs> you have um, you have Cleo sitting there listening while her maid Angel recounts this incredibly long and complicated story. And then you have this couple on the right side breaking up, and that the mirror. Of course, in Paris cafes, sometimes the walls are made of mirrors. And you have this big vertical line down the frame. It's like a graphic element that reminds us of how distant she is from these other ordinary people. And then in the cafe, later, after she has a breakdown and she has a fight with her composer, Michel Legrand, and she, she tears off her wig and puts on her Edith Piaf style dress and she walks out of her apartment and goes to that other cafe that cafe has a lot of mirrors too, but it's different from the hat scene. So, but I think, yeah, it's an important motif and it has different functions in different parts of that film. Yeah, that's a good point. Any so. last minute comments? Thank you for telling us so much, so impressive about Andy's father. Thank you for being here. Kelly Conway. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And of course, Vincent Seliger. Just, just to repeat and remind all of those who are interested and have the time to join us tomorrow at 10 o'clock uh, at the university in the film room. Uh, there's a workshop with Kelly where she will talk about uh, the process of writing her book.